Hello everyone, my name is Nadia Rosen and I'm the CEO of Head and Neck Cancer Australia. I'd like to welcome everyone today and thank you for joining our, our first webinar in 2022. I'm joining today from the land of the Gadigal people. We couldn't deliver these educational webinars without the support and expertise of our guest speakers. And today we're privileged to have Professor June Corey from Genesis Care and Dr. Rachel Dodd from the Daffodil Centre at the University of Sydney joining us. Thank you, June and Rachel. We're also incredibly grateful to Graham Lucy, a former patient and one of our ambassadors who will be our host today. Before I hand over to Graham to get the webinar started, I'd just like to share some good news from Head and Neck Cancer Australia. Last year, as some, of, as some of you may know, we made our first government submission for funding to support uh, for funding support to help improve early diagnosis and better support for people newly diagnosed with head and neck cancer. And I'm delighted to advise that we have recently be, we have recently received four hundred thousand dollars in federal government funding. Over the past year, we've worked very hard together with patients, carers, families, and healthcare professionals in the head and neck cancer community, meeting with politicians across all major parties to tell them about the harrowing experience of being treated for head and neck cancer, and to argue the case for investing in early diagnosis and better support for patients and families. It's fantastic to be able to share this news today. This funding will go directly towards helping us to work with GPs and dentists to raise awareness and reinforce the red flags of head and neck cancer, and especially to address the rising incidence of human papillomavirus, HPV related head and neck cancers, the topic that we're here to discuss today, as well as oral cancers in young women and supporting early and best practice referral to specialist head and neck cancer multidisciplinary teams to give patients the best possible outcome. The funding will also go towards supporting people who are newly diagnosed with head and neck cancer about what to expect and what support is available, helping to empower people to ask the right questions at the right time. Thank you to everyone who has been involved in this advocacy campaign, including some people who I know are joining us today. We know there's a long way to go to improving outcomes for people living with head and neck cancer, but this is a step in the right direction and we couldn't have done it without your support. Without further ado, let's get this webinar started. I'm delighted to hand over the hosting of today's webinar to Graham. As I mentioned, Graham's one of Head and Neck Cancer Australia's ambassadors. Graham is also the former CEO of the Melbourne Fashion Festival and was treated for head and neck cancer with surgery and chemo radiation in Melbourne in 2020. Graham reached out to us after his treatment, keen to use his personal experience, his profile and his leadership skills to help raise awareness of head and neck cancer and help to improve patient support and outcomes for which we are very grateful. Thank you, Graham, for being, us with, being with us today. Over to you. You're welcome. Thank you, Nadia. Hopefully everyone can hear me A-OK. -okay. So look, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the Gugu Yalanji people of far north Queensland, not where I live, but certainly from where I'm hosting this webinar today, the traditional custodians of this incredible land. And I pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and emerging. So yes, Nadia has pretty much summed it up. Um, look, I'm going to call myself a cancer survivor. And it was until recently, yes, the CEO of Australia's largest fashion event and, and all things associated with that incredible industry. But more recently, to be honest, I'm recovering and I'm managing from many shock waves that resulted from my experience and of course the journey I'm still on. And I am an active volunteer ambassador for Hidden Neck Cancer Australia. So my mission is really to help raise awareness where I can um, of the disease, but also promote early detection because certainly that was being a savior of my scenario. Reduce the stigma attached with HPV related cancers and ultimately help educate patients and their carers and those living with the disease. I've certainly had my fair share um, of treatments after finding a squashy little lump on my left-hand side neck uh, and after a pretty challenging time with uh, chemo radiation and surgery. I was then unfortunately diagnosed with um, oropharyngeal cancer on my right hand side as well. Um, ultimately coming from the same primary in the base of my tongue and that resulted in even more challenges, treatment and surgery and a couple of uh, emergency trips to hospital as well. Certainly was a journey. 
Well, I've got all the signs of being cured. I'm still recovering. And that's really clear and important to share. And I'm going through a bit of a metamorphosis myself. I'm managing significant side effects and people, most people wouldn't even know. Um, and I've learned to deal with them and live with them, or I'm trying to anyways. Um, but certainly it was the Hidden Neck Cancer Australia website where I found the greatest amount of information. And that's what's really important today. And really terrific news as night is announced with the funding that hopefully we can continue to grow the repertoire and of services and resources in, at, in that website. Um, this is the reality of Hidden Neck Cancer, long-term challenges that you'll face physically and mentally. Um, I was certainly lucky to have a knowledgeable GP in the first instance and many don't, unfortunately. It's become incredibly clear to me that um, more professional practitioners need to read the early signs. Um, and of course, encourage vaccination of girls and boys and positively help erode the stigma and promote the achievable survivorship. So look, here's some pretty daunting facts. So every day, 14 people in Australia are diagnosed with the type of head and neck cancer I had, and over 17,000 people are living with the side effects of treatment. 70% of tonsil and base of tongue cancers are caused from the human papilloma virus, HPV, the same virus that causes cervical cancer. These cancers are increasingly seen in people aged over 40 to 50, um, who are otherwise extremely healthy and have not had the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccination, which was introduced to girls in 2007 and boys in 2013, will not impact on the increasing incidence for the next 30 years. There are no screening tests for neck cancer, and only early detection can save lives. So the webinars are here to, designed to educate, as we're doing today, inform, share stories and support with people living with cancer, head and neck cancer, and anyone um, affected. Um, but please note that the content is always pitched to a bit of a lay audience, and that is um, what our incredible presenters um, are going to do today. The webinar is interactive, so please ask questions on the Q&A function. Um, both Nadia and I will have a look and we'll bring them into the conversation where we can. And please note, we're unable to address individual cases. And if you do have a personal question, please contact your, your cancer care team or the Cancel Council Australia on 13 11 20. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our social media and onto the Head and Neck Cancer Australia website in the next few days. And we will follow up with a short webinar survey. So please make sure that you fill that out at the conclusion of the event. Um, it, you know, all the information and feedback we get will help inform further webinar topics. So to our incredible speakers. Our first guest speaker presenter will be Dr. Rachel Dodd. Um, she's a senior research fellow at the Daffodil Centre, a joint venture between the Cancer Council in New South Wales and the University of Sydney. Rachel's work looks to improve health communications across a range of cancer types and screening programs. Her research to date has focused around communication in healthcare in combination with assessing psychosocial impacts of HP-related cancers. Rachel's current research is looking into communicating key concepts of HPV and cervical cancer. Rachel completed a master's in health psychology and PhD in psychology at University College of London and the UK. Now, Rachel will be our first up, but so we keep with the flow, I may as well also do the formal introduction to Professor June Corey. Um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, Professor Corey was also part of my treatment um, medical team, and I'm, I'm really grateful of everything that June was able to share with me and will share with us today. Initially trained as medical oncologist and then furthered her studies to include radiation oncology, specialising in head and neck cancers. She joined Genesis Care in July 2016 after 22 years at Peter Mac, the last 15 years as chair of that head and neck service. June is a founding member and past president of the Australian and New Zealand Head and Neck Cancer Society and International Academy of Oral Oncology. She's the previous executive of the Trans-Tasman Radiation Oncology Group and the Department of Health's Optimal Care Pathways for Head and Neck Cancer Patients. June is on several editorial boards and has a strong commitment to clinical research with over 130 publications and seven book chapters. June was recognised for her significant contributions to the industry by receiving the Trans-Tasmanian Radiation Oncology Group Outstanding Contribution Award in 2021. That was sure a mouthful. Um, everyone, um, let's open our minds, our hearts, and tune in to our very first presenter, Dr. Rachel Dodd, over to you. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, both Graham and Nadia. Um, and I also just want to start by um, thanking Head and Neck Cancer Australia for inviting me to speak at this webinar today as well as also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking from today, which um, is the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. 
So let me just quickly share my screen. So, um, so as Graham said, I'm a senior research fellow at the, um, the Daffodil Centre, which is um, a joint venture between the Cancer Council of New South Wales and the University of Sydney. And today I'm going to give you um, some, uh, an overview of some of the research that I did during my PhD and also some research that we've conducted recently. Um, and most of my research has been looking at how we communicate about HPV and head and neck cancer. So as Graham touched on a little bit, so human papillomavirus is a common sexually transmitted infection and most sexually active people will contract HPV at some point in their lives. So for most people, their immune system usually deals with HPV, um, but there's also 100 variants, um, over 100 variants of HPV and 15 types of those can be classified as high risk. And for those high risk types that we're talking about, they can be responsible for up to 5% of cancers worldwide. And this, this includes um, cervical, which most people will be most familiar with, but also anal cancers, penal cancers, um, vaginal cancers, vulva, and also some oropharyngeal cancers, which is what we're talking about today. So the link between HPV and head and neck cancer emerged um, over the last 20 years, probably a little bit uh, longer ago now, actually. Um, but it also appears to be biologically and clinically distinct to the to the head and neck cancers. So as kind of Graham said, you know, there is a slightly different demographic um, with patients who are being diagnosed with HPV and head and neck cancer. So five year survival rates of HPV related head and neck cancer are around 75 to 80%. And we know that HPV vaccination, as Graham also mentioned, um, that is uh, available now for school aged children could be a preventative measure against um, these cancers in the future. So as I said, I'm going to kind of give you a whistle stop tour through some of the studies that I conducted during my PhD. So I conducted my PhD in London. So just bear in mind, um, all of this evidence is, is from research that we've done in, in the UK. Um, but I'm just going to very briefly touch on each of these studies and tell you um, the findings from those. So first up, um, I started off with doing a systematic review, which is where we use um, strategic, uh, we use certain terms and we, we systematically review the, the literature that's available. Um, and I, based, I wanted to see what um, evidence there already was out there for psychosocial impact of HPV and oropharyngeal cancers, and also assess um, knowledge of HPV and oropharyngeal cancers as well. So what we found was that um, in seven out of the 23 studies that measured this, quality of life was higher in those that tested HPV positive than HPV negative, or there was um, studies that found that there was no difference. So in longitudinal studies, so that means studies that assess quality of life at, at, at multiple time points, found that um, quality of life scores were actually higher in HPV positive patients. Um, and then also that HPV status was also found to have no um, impact on quality of life outcomes at 12 months. So that means that um, the, the differences between the HPV positive and HPV negative had equaled out by 12 months. And even though they were found no concerning levels for depressive symptoms, perceived stress, anxiety or social support, they did find that there was um, some survivors felt stigma or shame associated with their diagnosis. And in terms of knowledge, this ranged considerably from 0.8% um, in a population of US adults up to almost 90% in dental students at one, at one university in the US. So we did find that knowledge was far greater in medical and dental um, sample, uh, so generally students, um, compared to the general population. So then next up, um, I decided to um, examine some of the, um, the, the information that was out there available in the media, um, particularly prompted by um, the story of Michael Douglas. Um, and I wanted to see how frequently the link between HPV and oral cancer was reported in the media, and also examine the content of these articles and look at what some of the main topics were and how it had been presented. So of the health information that I picked out of those media articles, these, this was the sort of information that was given. Um, so there was, um, it was often mentioned that HPV causes oral cancer. Um, there was also mention of the incidence and the fact that um, the number of cases are increasing. There was also information given about HPV. So some articles did actually talk about the fact that there's over hundred variants and that 80% of people will contract HPV. There was also mention of the better prognosis and survival rates for HPV-related cancers. Um, also, 
briefly touched on was um, about diagnosis and treatment, but then there was also some mention of symptoms um, and, a, and some emphasis put on the importance of um, dental appointments. So then that led to um, qualitative interviews that I conducted with health professionals, and this was um, across a range of, of health professionals in the UK. Um, and really, we wanted to, to talk to these health professionals to really find out what some of their experiences had been um, and their views of working with this patient group, um, because it was very much seen as a new, a new phenomenon of patients for, the, for these health professionals. So I wanted to try and seek explanations for differences in experiences in the hope that we could um, inform some future quantitative studies and interventions as well. So really these, um, so we interviewed 15 um, health professionals across um, England and Wales, and we included surgeons, oncologists, nurses, and allied health professionals. So this um, quote just says, just shows um, that all participants regarded HPV as important. Um, and this clinical oncologist described the changing demographic of the patients over the last decade. So to younger non-smoking and non-drinking patients. And there were mixed views about um, the benefits of talking about HPV to patients. And some felt that it was helpful for the patients to be able to label the cause of their cancer. And some such as this surgeon, um, felt that there was no benefit in telling them about HPV as there's nothing that they could do to adapt to their lifestyle which is going to make any difference to their outcome at all. Health professionals also talked about the challenges in terms of limits to their own knowledge and also discomfort about talking about sexual health matters um, and this oncologist gives an example of patients asking how they caught HPV, when they caught it and who they will have caught it from. And it was advocated that um, they should be honest with their patients about not knowing the answers to their questions. And it was also acknowledged that they are not used to talking about sexual health. And there was a lot of anecdotal stories about, um, about some of the health professionals that, that, that kind of got into working in head and neck cancer. So they didn't have to talk about sexual health. So this was quite um, a new area for them. So health professionals also acknowledge that some consultations could be influenced by the presence of a partner and some patients being more open to discussion about HPV without their partner present. So this oncologist just gives an example of a patient's wife asking how he got HPV and that it must be a sign that he'd been unfaithful. And examples where patients were fearful about transmitting HPV to their partner would sometimes result in couples ceasing sexual activity. And almost all patients, um, participants had experienced concerns and questions from patients, and some reported concerns um, about diagnosis and treatment, and others reported concerns around HPV and how it had been transmitted. So this nurse um, gives an example of a patient who was worried about transmitting HPV to his wife and his son, and also talking about the HPV vaccination. So participants gave examples of how they developed professionally already and suggested ways that this could be facilitated in the future, which included learning from others and further training. And this, this nurse gives an example of this and how, it, how um, she'd learned from her experiences and she'd actively gone and found out the answers to some of the questions that she'd been asked previously so that she was prepared for that question in the future. And so she was under the belief that if one, of, one person is going to ask, then someone else will as well. And then these were key messages then that participants gave to patients focused on trying to minimize possible negative psychological outcomes. So techniques for normalizing HPV included mentioning the higher prevalence of HPV, reassuring the patient that anyone who is sexually active will have been exposed to it. Explaining that HPV does not indicate that the patient has been promiscuous and linking HPV back to cervical cancer and the vaccination helped patients to also understand that the same virus is involved in both cancers and it's not something special. So if a patient was worried that they'd caused their cancer, participants would reassure them that there was nothing they needed to do to change their behaviour. And also telling patients that there was a, a better prognosis than those with HPV negative, cancer was seen as a bit of good news for them. So this then led to um, a study where we wanted to also focus on the patients and their partners and find out their experience of being diagnosed or of their partner being diagnosed. So again, we used um, qualitative methods. So this involved just doing interviews with patients and their partners. And um, we interviewed 20 patients and 12 of their partners. And of the patients, there was 14 males and six females. 
And um, we basically started the interviews by um, a very open question about their response, um, about their experiences of diagnosis. And then we also covered symptoms, diagnosis, and any psychological impact and information needs. And patients were recruited from two um, hospitals across the, uh, the UK. So the key themes that we found were to be about causal beliefs. So what patients and their partners knew or thought was the cause of their cancer, disclosure of HPV as a cause to others, and also being diagnosed with HPV, the prognosis and information needs. So in terms of causal beliefs, this covered the cause of patient's cancer and whether knowing about um, it being HPV mattered. Um, so this person here, you can see in this quote, said they really would have loved to have known what caused it, but to this day, they still don't know. Um, and that, but then there was also some patients that just didn't believe that it was um, important to know the cause didn't matter. It was just more about whether they um, could be treated and recover. So some patients weren't asked by others about the cause of their cancer, but for those who knew that HPV was the cause, some felt uncomfortable talking about it with others and felt um, a stigma attached to it being sexually transmitted. So you can see in this um, quote here, you don't go around broadcasting that something's sexually transmitted. <clears throat> and just to share some other um, of the participants' reactions to finding out that their cancer was caused by HPV, some expressed embarrassment, confusion, shock, surprise, disappointment, and just feeling unlucky. And here's just a couple of quotes from patients here. So you can see that um, one of them actually just found out by coincidence. So the 5000 survey was a, um, a research study that was um, happening at the time when they were diagnosed. And they just got given some information about that. And that's why they've actually realized that HPV was the cause. And then they got a bit embarrassed about, about that. They sort of, and the same patient also said it was, um, you know, he didn't feel comfortable discussing it with his wife. Um, and then there's also this, this whole um, factor of um, just this patient at the bottom who said that she'd only had four partners in her whole life. And then just in terms of prognosis, some of them mentioned that they were reassured by the higher survival rates for HPV related cancers. And in terms of information needs, most patients um, had not actually heard of HPV before their diagnosis. And um, this patient here told us that he preferred to get information from reputable sources rather than from the internet. And then these were just some of the questions that were that were that had come out of those um, those study, that study as well. So these were some of the questions that some of the patients were bringing um, to me so that they, that they had wanted information about and wanted answers to. So is HPV likely to travel around their body? What's the chance of it coming back? Where has it come from? How has it taken so long to come through? And have they still got HPV? Also, whether it's only sexually transmitted, talking about the prognosis, the treatment, and also worried about their children being more at risk. So all these studies um, led to uh, this, the final study of my PhD, which um, was used to develop information an information resource around HPV and head and neck cancer. And um, for this HPV resource, we actually used the term throat cancer as this was um, the, the terminology that the um, participants felt more comfortable with and thought that it was more commonly used and known and kind of encompassed quite a few different cancers. So um, to do this, we um, included contents from the key messages from the health professional study that are presented, some basic information about what HPV is, and then also some more specific information about HPV and oral cancer. So we engaged um, a, a, graf a graphic designer and social marketing company, um, and they were consulted to help us develop the materials, including um, options around the color palette, the typography, and also some of the imagery used. So we had input also from experts in the head and neck cancer field, as well as um, a patient advisory group who they um, provided comments and suggested drafts of the leaflet. So they commented on the use of our language, some of the images and graphics. They also highlighted if, we'd, um, if there was any information missing that they thought would be really vital to include, um, how they'd felt reading the booklet, and also um, if they would have liked to have received it and when they would have liked to have received it. So these are just a few snapshots of the booklet so far. I'm not going to go through it in detail today, but we are hoping that it is going to be available shortly. So then that led us to, so as I said, all of this research was conducted in the UK. Um, and then, um, so now we wanted to actually explore the suitability of the booklet for use here in Australia and New Zealand. So, um, so we actually 
engaged, uh, so Julia McCrossan, which I'm sure will be known to many of you, um, was also involved in this project and she helped us to um, recruit former patients um, to test the readability, comprehensibility and acceptability of the booklet and we also wanted to see how people felt while they were reading the booklet as well. So um, participants were recruited through social media and we interviewed them via Zoom. So we showed them the booklet online and we used the think aloud method, which basically um, includes uh, a dot at the end of each sentence. So it encourages people that as they're reading through the booklet at the end of each sentence where they see a red dot, they're asked to tell us how they felt about that sentence, whether it made sense, whether it needed rewording or um, you know, whether it was good and how it made them feel. So we analysed each of these um, parts of the booklet against whether they, they liked it or they didn't. Um, and then we also analysed some of the um, other responses thematically. So we, we used qualitative methodology there. So we had 24 participants um, and the majority of them didn't need any help reading medical information. So we're very aware that this was a highly literate um, sample. So we're also very keen to once we've uh, been able to, to use this a bit more that we, we, we um, make sure that we also test it in people that have, have a lower health literacy level. Um, and the majority of them were um, advised actually of their HPV um, diagnosis, um, the, the cause of their cancer being HPV at the diagnosis stage. So this is just to give you an overview of what we found. So we found that in terms of, um, so these were the key themes that came out, so information needs. So they talked about information seeking and any knowledge gaps from the booklet. In terms of the booklet response, they talked about the helplessness, um, the helpfulness of the booklet. Um, as I said, the changes for, the changes against, and also some recommendations. In terms of the emotional response, they talked about shame and stigma that they'd felt of their diagnosis. Um, a sense of relief or comfort and, and fear that they still had about their diagnosis, concern for family, unlucky attitude, and also patient, the need for patient support. And then finally, the health service factors. So this included the role of the healthcare professionals, the role of the vaccination, any pathway delays, and also other conditions. So just to give you an example of what some of the participants said, so they, in terms of information needs, they said, I think my experience is, is a lot of people want that detail when they're going through the diagnosis and treatment plan, and I just don't like uncertainty. In terms of their response to the booklet, because family and everyone want to know, and you can just hand it to them, and then they can see it for themselves and what it is, and you don't have to explain. So it was seen as um, a real resource that they could actually use for their, um, their immediate family and also friends that they kind of felt uncomfortable wanting to talk to HPV about, but they could just give the booklet to um, and they would be able to um, read it for themselves. And this is in terms of the emotional response. So there was this very much this feeling of just feeling unlucky um, and, you know, this person saying that they could deal with being un unlucky rather than that they'd done something that they were to blame for. And then just finally, um, talking about the fact that we mentioned the vaccine in the booklet. So I think that's great that they did the vaccine. And I hope that that really does show the numbers, reduced numbers of throat cancer because of it. So really in summary, um, all the participants found the booklet useful. A large proportion wished the resource had been available previously when they'd been diagnosed. And some also indicated that there was information in there that was new to them. The majority agreed that the booklet would be best delivered by their specialist at their point of diagnosis and that it would be a useful resource for their friends and family. And the feedback that we received um, commonly related to some of the design and just comprehension of some of the aspects of the booklet. So most people also found that it helped to reduce shame and stigma associated with HPV as a sexually transmitted infection. So overall, we found that the booklet was well received and the content was easy to understand. So just in summary, we found that the, an evidence-based booklet was um, found to be acceptable for patients and their partners. Um, the booklet can give support and reassurance to patients and their partners, and implementation may be feasible in routine clinical practice, specifically at the time of diagnosis. So this booklet can be used to improve communication about sensitive topics such as HPV and minimize the potential of ne negative psychosocial impact. Now, this certainly wasn't just all work that I did by myself, so I just want to acknowledge um, my PhD supervisors over there on the left and some also some, um, some clinicians that I worked with closely in the UK. And then um, also my team on the right hand side who've all been heavily involved in the evaluation of the booklet that we've just completed. 
And thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, don't um, hesitate to email me or there's my Twitter handle as well. Um, all of these papers have been published with the final one just under review at the moment. So if you do want any more detail, I can also send you the picture, the, um, the actual uh, manuscripts for those. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so just a reminder, if you've got any questions, please pop them in down the bottom of your Zoom feed here. But we do have a few that uh, came in a bit early, so we might uh, raise this. There's been some conversation around the mental preparedness for undergoing um, your head and neck cancer treatment. What, um, what sort of study and, and, and have you got any insights into the, uh, the ability for mental health to be framed very early on in your diagnosis? I know personally, I was kind of unprepared for, for the, 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 the mental gymnastics that were about to, to play out for me. Um, do you have any thoughts on that in your research around the mental, the mental preparedness? Yeah, I think um, quite a lot that's come out from not only just this research, but other research that um, that we're doing is that it really seems that really having some of that information up front and kind of spelling out to the patients from from the start what might be involved in their journey rather than um, rather than kind of piecemeal along the way where they're not quite prepared for it at each point, whereas if we can spend a little bit more time in that preparation period. Um, you know, kind of informing them about things so that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that still go away and use Dr. Google and, um, you know, find out information that can be quite alarming. And then, so if we can really try and prepare people from the start um, for what might, they might be facing ahead is, is, is one of the, the ways that we've found um, can really help kind of reduce that anxiety and, and, and other um, psychosocial impact along the way. Okay. Thank you. Um, apologies, my video is not on, but I am here. Um, I think, <laughs> but um, I also wanted to, we, we talk about, um, I, if I've got this right, 58% um, incidence is 58% higher in Indigenous populations. Um, I know you mentioned that you're hoping the study and the research you've done um, with, uh, with, your with the focus group you've been working on. Um, what, what do you hope we could achieve and, and what is required to engage with Indigenous communities to really understand um, you know, this, this really dreadful um, incoming disease into, into Indigenous populations? Yeah, thanks, Graham. So I think that, um, I mean, just in another study that we're working, we're really trying to um, use co-design work as well so that we're actually using those communities that are most at high risk in the design of these sorts of information resources as well so one of the things that we do hope to do um, with this resource is also translate it into other languages so that um you know so that it's accessible for our cal communities as well which are also more at risk and also um yeah go out to some of those aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and, and try and see kind of what they would actually like to see in in a resource and how we can actually adapt it to be more suitable for them so I'd say if anyone on this webinar would like to put their hand up, please, please um, get in contact if, if yep. I can probably be so bold as to encourage that. Um, another one that's come up is just around religion. And obviously we are talking about, you know, um, HPV being contracted through sexual activity. And my understanding is, um, you know, some may find that confronting because of their religious beliefs. But um, to just really sort of play this into reality, this also just includes tongue kissing. Is that is that not right? It's it's potentially not just um, you know when we're talking about it being sexually transmitted. Can it also be through tongue kissing? So there has been some um, evidence of that. Um, I haven't. I don't know how strong that evidence is. I haven't mm -hmm. looked into it more recently. Um, but. There definitely has been some health professionals as well, kind of trying to use that as a way to dispel this kind of the stigma attached to it by kind of saying, you know, you you may well have just got this by kissing as opposed to through oral sex. So trying to, you know, reduce that the impact of that there. So um, there is some evidence, um, but how much it's it's hard to measure compared to potentially oral sex. And uh, Rachel, I think probably the last question, and again, just encouraging anyone to jump onto question and answers. I can't see any at yet, unless Nadia has any, she might raise a hand. But um, I, I guess one thing that um, you, you mentioned, and certainly in my own understanding and, and researching into what, I, what I've been through and what I've had, 
is it's unfortunately the disease is striking younger um, Australians in this context as well. Um, so do you think that the brochure and some of the materials you're developing, um, there's going to be a time frame where we're really going to need to understand a younger generation, in fact, because uh, we are talking about the vaccination. Um, there's still another 30 odd years ahead of us, unfortunately, with people who are going to be unfortunately diagnosed or living, living with head and neck cancer. Um, are there any sort of ideas or do we want to put it out to everyone to suggest ideas to help help educate younger audiences? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of one of also the, the hopes with, you know, now vaccinating boys. I mean, I know that we've, uh, you know, been vaccinating boys here in Australia for quite a number of years. But in the UK, for example, that's only just kind of been implemented in the last few years. So, so really, you know, approaching it making them understand why they're having the vaccine, right? Because, you know, even boys at that age used to think, oh, it's just to help the girls because of cervical cancer. Whereas, you know, actually making, acknowledging the fact that there are other cancers, anal cancers, penile cancers, that they're all still at risk for because of HPV, you know, educating them even at that age would, would probably be somewhere, yeah, that could definitely use some, some resources, I would think. Okay, I've got some through. Fantastic. So we've got here, is there any evidence to suggest vaccination against HPV, even as an adult, can help in the prevention of head and neck cancers? So it's a mixed bag and it's not recommended um, because you've already been exposed to the virus, more than likely. Um, so it depends on, you know, there's some people that kind of think, oh, it might be beneficial because it might protect me against uh, a type that I might not have had before um, but a lot of people don't know what what HPV type they've had before so it's very um, you know it's very up in the air so it's it's mixed evidence I, I, it's not really recommended to to vaccinate after you've already been exposed. Okay and we've got here as a mum of a 15 year old should I be discussing vaccination with my GP or the 15 year old? Okay. Who would you suggest? I'm, I'm assuming this is suggesting who, who first, GP or the, or, or the 15 year old? Um, so the, I'm surprised the 15 year old hasn't been approached by the school a few years ago. Um, it would be my first uh, thought, to be honest, um, because they would have actually received some information by the school based program that, that um, about the vaccination. So there should actually have already been that kind of opening in there to have that conversation. Um, so I would find out first why that hasn't happened. Um, and, but yeah, I would, I would be very open about, about the vaccination with both the teenager and then, and then also with, with the GP, if that's the route that they need to go get the vaccine down if they haven't through the school. Fantastic. And, and there's a question here that is um, something I, I would probably want to ask as well. Um, has there been any studies on the reoccurrence and or follow up after five years? Um, we all know the five-year mark um, with, with cancer, um, uh, you know, striving for that five-year mark, but is there any studies uh, in any reoccurrence after that five years? Not that I'm aware of, but that might be a question for June. June might be a bit more um, yeah. across that, so maybe ask that again for June. <laughs> right. Prepare you, June, for this one. Um, and uh, I think probably the last one we might need to, to wrap up and, and move on to um, Professor Corey. But um, last one here, since I had HPV, had my surgery and radiation, does that mean I can infect others? So again, so this is really going back to whether you'll get HPV again or whether you've got rid of the HPV virus, right? Yeah. Um, so again, the evidence is still mixed on whether um, whether you do get rid of HPV or not. And there's actually a part of the booklet that we talk about this, um, whether you kind of get rid of it or not. Um, so most people will get rid of, so just naturally within 18 months of kind of having the, the virus, so there's no, but there's no need to change your behavior. If you, even if you know that you've got HPV, you don't need to say, I'm not gonna have sexual, you know, I'm not gonna be sexually active with anybody because I've got HPV. The person that you're being sexually active with may well also have already had it, you know, you, so it's very, yeah, it's very difficult to, to say whether you've got rid of it, but also I wouldn't let it change your behavior anyway. And um, I think this one's quite relevant to conversations we've just had about a younger audience. There's a comment here. It's more of a statement than a question. I've worked in sexual health vaccination program and 
am an oncology nurse. Um, in regard to education for younger populations, different platforms like social media, as opposed to hard copy brochures works well. So, um, you know, Rachel, have you, have you um, been seeing that and hearing that? And do you think that we should all really be stepping up into TikTok and social media, to be honest? Yeah, and that's certainly also come out from some of our cervical cancer research as well, that we can't target uh, TV ads or radio ads for, for younger populations. They just don't work. So, um, yeah, absolutely. We've definitely been seeing that in some of our current research that we need to um, adapt with the times <laughs> and um, try and become a bit more tech savvy and uh, down with the kids, I guess they say. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, a big sort of uh, webinar round of applause for you, Dr. Rachel Dodd. Thank you so much. And um, I'd now like to introduce um, the incredible Professor June Corey um, and um, for your presentation, Professor. Thanks very much, Graham. Good to see you. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to Head and Neck Australia for inviting me to talk. And uh, thank you to Rachel for her great work and um, her talk. And I think her booklet's great. And, and uh, I look forward to having access to it. Uh, like the others, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, which here in Melbourne is the peoples of the East Coolan uh, Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So what I thought I would do today is um, basically look at um, the background of uh, human papillomavirus oropharyngeal carcinoma. I can understand patients just wanting to say throat cancer because it's much easier. Um, I just talk a little bit about my approach for um, when I see a new patient with um, HPV OPC. I want to talk a little bit about why we recommend different treatments for different patients, the outcomes and the follow up and then uh, leave time for questions and also some questions that I um, think patients should ask. So when I first started in head and neck cancer, um, pretty much everyone have, was smokers. Um, everyone knows that smoking causes lung cancer. They're not so aware that it also causes head and neck cancers. So, um, now, with all the great work Australia's done, we've got one of the lowest rates of smoking in the world, 12% of patients, but we did notice that um, there was an increase in oropharyngeal cancer. So where, whereas other smoking-related diseases were decreasing, um, oropharyngeal cancers were increasing. And so it became... Um, the first sort of publications of this were in 2010. This study um, in the New England Journal was a big American study, and this one in the Journal of Clinical Oncology was a big Australian-led but international study. Um, and before I go into that, I might just talk a little bit about some definitions. So just looking at the anatomy, um, oropharynx cancer and oral cavity cancers are very different um, beasts even though they're pro very close together anatomically. So essentially the oral, what, oral cavity cancers are what you see when you look in your mouth. So it's composed of your oral tongue, which is the tongue you see in your mouth. Under that's the floor of the mouth and above that is your roof of your mouth or your heart palate. Whereas the oropharynx, you uh, can see the tonsils and the soft palate partly, but you really need the scope to see the base of tongue, which is tucked down behind what you can see through your mouth. So that's the oropharynx and that's the anatomy we're talking about today. Um, we test for human, human papillomavirus using uh, a P16 stain. It stains cancer cells and it's pretty accurate in showing that that cancer was related to causally to human papillomavirus. P16 is an easy and reliable test and it's done routinely in all the labs. It's also done on a lot of cancers that aren't um, originating from the oropharynx and it, that in those different sites, it hasn't been shown to be a good prognostic factor at all. It's actually irrelevant, but um, it's certainly in oropharynx cancer, as we've already heard, is a good prognostic factor. 
Testing for human papillomavirus, we have done that in clinical trials, but it's not routinely available. So a patient can't go and get um, HPV tested for oropharynx cancer. So the way I think about um, human papillomavirus oropharyngeal carcinoma, I think an analogy with chickenpox and then developing shingles later in life is not a bad one because um, back in the 60s when the oral contraceptive pill became available, that gave us all greater sexual freedom and essentially most uh, sexually active adults had get human papillomavirus. The vast majority, it's an asymptomatic illness. They don't know they've had it and the vast majority uh, clear that virus. But in a percentage of people, the human papillomavirus is incorporated into the tissues of the oropharynx, and we don't know why it, it localizes to the oropharynx. But then in a small percentage of those people, more likely in men three times to women, they develop oropharyngeal cancer you know, up to 10 to 40 years later of the uh, human papillomavirus infection. So the things that you've sort of heard today is um, that you, although you have human papilloma virus related oropharyngeal cancer, you're not going to give it to your partner. It's also very, very rare for you to get it in a different uh, site within your oropharynx at a local time. And there is this long time lag between having HPV and developing oropharyngeal cancer, which means it's not a current sexually transmitted disease. We don't really know why some people develop oropharyngeal cancer and others don't after have, or most don't after having a HPV infection and that's certainly research in progress. And it's intriguing to me that we've known for a long time that uh, human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer in women. And I may be wrong, but it doesn't seem to have the same awkwardness as uh, that knowledge causing uh, oropharyngeal cancer in uh, men and women does for uh, quite a few of our patients. So just some background facts on um, overall survival. So this was the study I showed you earlier, the Australian-led international study, which uh, was published in 2010. It was really the first time we sort of heard about this new disease uh, in the literature. And it showed, um, the study was, was looking at different chemo radiotherapy regimens, but the uh, key part of the study was that the patients with um, human papillomavirus in the red uh, versus the patients who were human papillomavirus negative had a big difference in overall survival. At two years, it was 94% in the HPV positive patients and 77% in the HPV negative. So that's a big uh, difference. And the reason for that difference was several. Um, the main one, if you look in the red here, the risk of the cancer coming back either in the um, base of tongue tonsil or neck nodes was much lower in the HPV positive patients than in the HPV negative patients, as you see here in black and red. The distant metastatic disease was low in both, pretty much the same, but the HPV positive patients, because um, majority of them were not smokers, they didn't die of other smoking related illnesses, other smoking related cancers like lung cancer or heart attacks or strokes. So that was the, um, these two were the big difference in why they had such a better um, outcome. And this was shown also in that other paper I showed you from the States um, where they showed that the, uh, the red the arrows uh, fallen off, but nevertheless, HPV positive patients uh, in the low risk group had a very good three year survival um, compared to the high risk uh, HPV negative patients whose survival was much poorer. And then there was an intermediate risk if they were heavy smokers or um, had early disease in HPV negative. So that sort of information um, was really interesting to us as clinicians. It was a, it was a new disease. And um, subsequent to that, there's been lots of research in this area. And uh, just sort of putting down here, the, the point I wanna make is that it does have a good prognosis. This study here is a study we just completed here in Australia, um, published uh, last year and showing this uh, three year, very uh, excellent survival um, and very low uh, recurrence rate locally or and very low distant metastatic rate. This is five year data. These patients had slightly um, more advanced disease and, uh, but again, still very excellent uh, outcomes for these patients. 
So based on the HPV uh, status, <clears throat> that changed our staging system so that uh, before, if you had uh, um, multiple nodes or a T4 primary, then you were stage four disease. But now if that is with P16 positive, you're, you're downstage because your prognosis is better. And so now you've become either stage two or three. So when um, seeing a new human papilloma virus uh, OPC patient, I think the really important thing is to build a strong relationship. It's a really tough treatment they're going to go through. Their world's just turned upside down with this cancer diagnosis. And so they need to feel that uh, they're going to get through and come out the other end of this uh, whole process. So in that time, you're taking a history, you're examining them, reviewing the imaging they've had done to formulate a, an optimal management plan for that particular patient. And that plan should be uh, discussed at a head and neck multidisciplinary meeting. We do discuss the role of HPV in, uh, in their cancer, but probably not well enough. Uh, there's a lot to discuss. We discuss the treatment, uh, why we're not using surgery, for example, and using chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We discuss the whole radiotherapy planning, the side effects in the short term and the long term, and also um, talk about uh, outcomes. So there's a balance between trying to inform patients of the key information and not trying to um, over, overload them. So just to sort of summarize on how we um, recommend a treatment. So essentially it's all um, based on staging of disease, which we use the T and M system, which you're probably familiar with, where T is the tumor, N is nodes, and M is distant metastatic disease. And so essentially for early stage disease, these patients can be treated with either robotic surgery if it's available, or um, radiotherapy on its own for this early stage disease has excellent uh, outcomes. They both have excellent outcomes. And they're both very good treatments, but because robotic surgery is a little bit faster recovery and takes a shorter time to deliver, uh, that's uh, often a preferred treatment if it's available in this early stage disease. More advanced disease um, needs chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And sometimes patients have uh, robotic surgery thinking it's early stage disease, but there's features um, that we see under the microscope of the specimen that shows that they need additional treatment. And this happens um, in about 30% of these patients. And we try to avoid this if possible, because then these people have to deal with the side effects of surgery and radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And so uh, they're, they're better off if, if we uh, think they're going to need additional treatment that they have chemo radiotherapy first off. So you, you uh, are Patients watching this are all very familiar with the um, planning that we need to do to plan their treatment, making of the masks, checking that they're not claustrophobic um, and dealing with that if they are, and then doing the CT scan uh, with IV contrast in the treatment mask. And that takes some time. Um, we then mark, this is a really important part from my point of view of marking up the volumes accurately, marking up what we want to give high dose radiotherapy to. So the, um, tumor in the base of tongue and in the lymph nodes, the sort of things we want to avoid like saliva glands, swallowing muscles, brachial nerves, um, spinal cord, voice box, and then um, having the radiotherapy team, uh, planning team work out how they're going to deliver that radiotherapy treatment to exactly where we want it. So in terms of the side effects of treatment, I won't go through the acute ones, which you all know, and which are pretty tough and basically relate to the um, pain of the radiation uh, ulcers in the throat um, and to the difficulties eating and the importance of nutrition. Uh, the long-term side effects, so that when you've finished all your treatment and what you have to deal with in the years to come, I have to say it's been amazing the difference that better technology in delivery of radiotherapy, so specifically intensity modulated radiotherapy has made. The patients you see now compared to 15 years ago is, uh, is a very different, uh, uh, much reduced side effects. You might find that hard to believe, guys, but it's true. Um, so it means we can spare uh, their saliva glands to some extent. There's better recovery of saliva. Uh, the taste is still somewhat imperfect, 
the cisplatin can still cause significant hearing loss, um, as in needing hearing aids in 6% of people who get high dose cisplatin and still 3% of people who get the weekly cisplatin. Um, and their swallowing is often slower than it was prior to treatment. But fortunately, it's very rare to have um, radiation damage to the jawbone, which is a horrible complication. You rarely see it now. And equally, you, uh, we haven't seen a permanent feeding tube in this disease for a long time. So I'm, all my patients have seen this, but I just want to share with you some of the, um, uh, the end outcome of uh, all this torture that we put, put you through. So on the, on the right here, we have the pre-treatment PET scan, and you know that red is bad, so that's showing disease in the tonsil and the neck node. And then this one on the left is the post-treatment PET scan showing a complete metabolic response. So resolution of all disease, uh, complete remission. And similarly, this is a different patient showing a big base of tongue cancer here and, and nodes on both sides of the neck. And in the post-treatment uh, uh, PET, you can see that that's all gone. Uh, this is another patient with a, a big uh, uh, tonsil cancer and lymph nodes. You can see that that's just a bit of muscle activity there, but you can see in the post-treatment PET, that's all gone. I could show you these all day. It's such a, uh, I love seeing these. Um, but just this is a patient who had a, perhaps a more typical presentation, a small primary and a big neck node, which resolved uh, in the three month post-treatment scan. And I think this is the last one, again, showing a big base of tongue cancer, big bilateral nodes, which all resolved following uh, treatment. So in terms of what we call a complete metabolic response, which is basically no red spots in your scan, um, on, on our data, that translates into a cure in 90% of cases. So it's a really, um, it's quite a challenging time for patients to come back and, and uh, just check that that's what's been achieved, but it's also a really uh, important step into um, moving into the next phase of their uh, cancer journey. So I might just stop there so that people have got uh, time to ask questions, but uh, these are just some of the questions that I think it would be worthwhile uh, patients asking because I think it's very important that their treatment I see the multidisciplinary meetings as a really great advocacy for patients because we, the clinicians treating them, surgeons and radiation oncologists and medical oncologists can argue about what's the best treatment for that patient in a way that I think uh, ensures that they get what's evidence, best evidence-based treatment. And we know that head and neck cancer is not common. And so it's important that you treat it at a center that's uh, used to treating them and has got good experience with treating them. Um, and I, as we've talked about before, I think uh, just a plug for Australian health system, we were the first in the world to uh, include boys in the HPV vaccination free uh, school uh, um, vaccination schedules. Um, and that was because of this disease and that was because of advocacy from us. So I think that's been a great thing and it's got a good um, uptake, but we need to be big advocates for that because ultimately that will eradicate this disease, uh, not in my working lifetime, but nevertheless in due course. So I'll just stop there to give people a chance to ask any questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Corey, and a big thank you webinar. Thank you to you as well. Um, that was sensational. And um, I'm going to kick start with um, a lovely uh, compliment, June, which has come up on the q and I just wanted to say a big thank you to Professor Corey. 11 years ago, you helped my dad with HPV-related uh, <clears throat> base of tongue cancer whilst I was at university. He's all clear and doing well. And I'm now a speech pathologist working in the field of head and neck cancer. So I thought um, that might also then open up the conversation around speech pathology. And I can remember during my treatment, um, I didn't understand why I was seeing speech pathologists, but they're so critical. And now I'm, I'm challenged by my swallowing and sometimes my dry mouth and, and talking. Um, June, how important are the speech pathologists in, in the field of your work um, after, after someone's undergone the radiation oncology and, and handing over to them? 
Look, I think it's a big team effort uh, treating head and neck, any head and neck cancer. And I think speech pathology is very important, probably more important in patients with, you know, voice box cancers, for example, or piriform fossil cancers. But certainly, um, like if you just look at exam, when I was first training, I was told that, you know, patients swallow, uh, swallowing returns to normal, their taste returns to normal. And clearly, if you ask patients about these things, that is not true. Um, so I think... Uh, in the acute phase, the, the probably have more weight on the dietitians than the speech pathologists. But I think in the longer term follow up, um, the speech pathologist uh, in terms of swallowing is, is really helpful. I think the other area that's really important and that we don't have enough resources for is, is the whole mental uh, emotional support, the psychology support or um, you know, there's lots of help that patients need that we often don't um, have access to. And COVID's only made that worse, really. So, yeah, I think it's a big team effort. There's lots of, um, lots of people involved. And I think um, patients are often quite surprised at how many people are involved in their care. Mm. Thank you, Professor. Now we're right on 1 p.m. So we're going to run slightly late. This is being recorded. So if you need to go, it will be back up onto the Head and Neck Cancer uh, website. Nadia, and I saw you had your hand up, the CEO of Head and Neck Cancer Australia. Nadia, did you have something you wanted to, to say? Oh, thanks, Graham. I think that was from when Rachel was talking earlier. So that that's okay. Um, I'm just looking at some questions that came in when people registered. Um, so uh, let me just have a look here. I think, I guess one, one person did ask what progress is being made around such a stringent treatment protocol of chemo radiation over six weeks. Um, maybe that's for you, Professor Corey. Yeah, um, I certainly will answer that. Also, just there's a question there about um, survival numbers between five and 10 years. Because this is a relatively new disease, the um, latest data we have published at the moment is, is basically based around five years, um, but there will be more data coming out on 10 and 15 years. Um, in other head and neck cancers, of the people who are going to recur, 80% of them do so within the first three years, actually, and then a smaller percentage up to five years and very few after that. Um, we don't know if uh, this disease is different to that. It's probably not, but essentially at the moment we that that's it. that's ongoing research that will be published in due course but we don't have a lot more data on longer than five years at the moment um, in terms of your question about uh, treatment intensity uh, we that trial I showed you um, from Australia that was uh, there were three other or four other big trials around the world in the UK, America and Scandinavia and Australia, all basically looking at whether we could get good, excellent results by reducing the intensity and toxicity of, of the treatments we were using that produced those results. There was a stage there about five years ago where we thought we could just breathe on this, puff on this disease and it would go away. Um, so it was pretty shocking to find that when we did reduce treatment intensity, we also lost cancer control. Um, that's pretty sobering. We were hoping we'd maintain cancer control and have less treatment side effects, um, but that wasn't the case. So that's made us all more cautious about um, proceeding in this area. It's not to say we're not proceeding in trying to work out what's the least uh, intensive treatment we can give that still cures the cancer. But it's just made us a little bit more cautious because obviously patients' primary concern is to have their cancer cured. Um, side effects, obviously it'd be ideal to have none, but that's not very realistic. Um, but mo patients generally don't wanna have fewer side effects if it means they've got a higher risk of having their cancer return. And Professor Corey, what, the, what is the meaning of HPV positive versus HPV negative? Yeah, so essentially it's going back to testing the cancer cell to see whether um, it's HP, the human papillomavirus has been involved in, in causing that cancer. So it's a stain, which I could have showed you, but basically um, they take the tissue uh, into the pathology lab, they use a stain, and it's, if that stain is taken up by the cancer cells and it's um, HPV positive or P16 positive, um, whereas the, if it's not, then, it, then it's, um, it's not related to human papillomavirus. Mm. 
Fantastic. Now, I'm um, noting that we have gone slightly over time. I've had one for anyone out there who's undergoing treatment and has had to deal with claustrophobia or is claustrophobic. I'm going to put my hand up and Professor Corey knows exactly what I'm going to say. I am, I am claustrophobic and I found it very confronting and I do want to lend some advice to everyone. You can do this and, and um, <clears throat> all the practitioners, excuse me, um, um, that I've come across have, have been wonderful. And um, I just want everyone who's worried and concerned about whether it's a CT scan or wearing the mask, you can do this because I did it and I know you can. So that's, that's one thing. Um, look, it is probably time to wrap up everyone. Uh, I wanted to really thank you, Professor Corey, for that incredible insights. And um, uh, thank you, Dr. Rachel Dodd as well. Um, Nadia, CEO of Head and Neck Cancer Australia and what fantastic news you shared with us. Um, at the beginning, um, it's a small amount of money. We want a lot more, don't we? Um, but of course, all the money that the charity can raise is gonna help us to communicate uh, this disease and help people live with the disease and help people to manage as, as, as Professor Corey said, there is a whole mental side of, of this disease that is untapped and undocumented and therefore not really facilitated uh, with resources. And, we, and that's something that I know personally um, I'm challenged with. Um, I wanted to, to really thank um, everyone who's listened um, and contributed to the Q and A's. I think we tried to get all of them. Of course, sometimes we can't, can't get everything, but um, as we said, we will be putting this back onto the Head and Neck Cancer Australia website. And um, please make sure you fill in your questionnaire. Uh, thanks to everyone and be kind to each other. And as June had said, we've got some fantastic medical practitioners and it's fantastic to be in Australia and have so much support um, to cure and you know, eradicate um, head and neck cancer eventually. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Graham. Great job. Thanks everyone.